Welcome to the Disruptor Network Podcast. Welcome back to the Disruptors Network Podcast. We have a great guest for you today with Robbie Clark. Robbie is the CEO of SID Development, a real estate investment firm in Ontario, Canada. They're one of the largest companies buying real estate throughout Canada, but it's created to start that way. First, he was a child acting star and films with such people as Charlie Sheen and Will Farrell and even Wayne Gretzky. After that, Robbie went broke, bankrupt actually. He got back on his feet, educated himself, and started buying real estate. And today, his company now has over 350 properties. It's an amazing story of how he scaled his business and how you can scale yours. So without further ado, let's get to it. Robbie Clark. Ignition. Liftoff. Welcome back to the Disruptors Network. We have an amazing guest today. I just said a lot in the intro about him, but welcome, Robbie Clark. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Dude, uh, you have a really, really interesting story, and you know we share a real estate background, but you kind of had a life before that, and in the middle of that, and after that. And I know you probably told the story a million times, but you know you were a child uh, acting star, correct? Be- originally. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, star is is relative in Canada. Yeah, I was uh, <laughs> I was pretty successful right uh, there in in a full time actor and one of the uh, definitely top uh, uh, teenage uh, actors there at the time, right? So. Uh, some a lot of it was you know American productions done in Canada different things but yeah that was the first uh, you know, kind of real job I had I had some other things but from like 11 through 18 I really kind of finished off around 21 uh, but that was uh, the acting world for me for sure. Now now obviously you have a, a huge real estate portfolio at this point and we'll get into that but did you start buying real estate that young with like at 21 were you already kind of transitioning into that or that took some time. No, it's funny. I feel like I would have been an entrepreneur sooner if it wasn't for acting. My problem was like, and I feel like everybody with a job does this, but at the time I knew what I made. I made really good money, right? So if I make two, three thousand a day in my head, I'm like, you know, in overtime some weeks, you'd be making 15, 15, 20,000 a week. So it changes your perspective on money, but I'm working for that. Like I still have to audition. I get hired. And then, you know, I had a good flow because I, I worked extremely hard uh, at my sure. craft. Like, like anything, like entertainment is the same way. People might think acting, they can look at it and be like, oh, there's no real work. If you're not putting in the work, you're not going to get the, the job. It's like sports. It's like any other industry. So you got to really be there mentally and, um, uh, and you got to train your craft. So, you know, you know, I was doing that for a lot, but it, it screwed up my relationship with money because I was always into sports, things like that. I, you know, I was uh, decent at school when I tried, like I was good at math, but you know, I was like, ADHD without the Ritalin kind of thing. So I couldn't yeah, yeah. <laughs> one place. So, I mean, that was, you know, uh, an advantage and a disadvantage. So acting was an advantage because I made a lot of money. I made seven figures. Um, but then I actually wound up losing it all and, uh, and went bankrupt actually over a relatively small amount. I just had no financial education. And it really had to do with the fact that my union was um, uh, over contributing to my RRSPs when I was a minor. And I didn't know that. Okay. So I was getting uh, tax for that in the future, even though I'd already depleted those funds. So really, I wound up filing because I had poor advice and, and I really didn't need to, but I had no money is the end of the story. And then I had to, uh, you know, I didn't really have a high school education. So I went to start serving tables and bartending just to, to get by. And that's when I started reading because I'm like, well, I'm not really educated. So what am I going to do? And picked up some books and then came across Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, by Robert Kiyosaki, which is you know, whether you're buying real estate or not, I think the easiest way to break down the difference between an asset and a liability for anybody. Uh, getting Absolutely, started, like, yes. Like yeah. the idiot's guide to, to becoming wealthy, right? Like, and I mean <laughs> that with the most respect. And uh, and it's a feel-good book too, uh, because it makes you feel like like anything is is possible. And that's kind of how I got started. So having that success in, in being around very successful people or actors, Molly Shannon, you know, uh, um, Emilio Estevez, Charlie Sheen, uh, Drake, like you, you name it, I'd been around them and I'd, I'd met with them. So that gave me confidence to be around those people. And then failing really young gave me confidence. But uh, I always thought that I would have to work. And it's like, if I get another job, then I'll get paid. And so my expenses reflected that. Like if I went shopping, I'd be like, okay, well, this only took me, you know, 15 minutes to make. Or if I had bottle service at a club at like 17 or yeah. 19, right? Like yeah. I'd be like, oh, okay, this was like an hour of work. It's all good. But you were still, do, you know, it's, you were still doing the math in your head even at that age, which is which is interesting. So you were already kind of on that level. You probably just didn't realize it. Yeah, and I wasn't uh, conditioned to to sell a product or service myself. I was the commodity, right? So you yeah. know, people would use me and build, and that's that's how the difference between running, you know, being the producer of a production or, or being the the actor. The actors are like um, are like athletes. You're high paid entertainers, except it's very very few of you are high paid. I think you know. Five, six years ago, there was important SAG for SAG members. Less than a thousand members made more than a hundred thousand a year. It's crazy. 
And so there's a big discrepancy, right? So you're doing really well or you're not doing good at all. I was fortunate to do very well uh, when I was younger, but then I lost motivation for it. And once you do that, things start to... Uh, it's, like, it's like there's no middle class. Like there's just there's just the rich and the super rich. <laughs> so, that's a good way to look at it. That's so true because yeah, that's the same yeah. sports as well too, right? You know that. Yeah. Too. The minor leagues, I mean, they have some better opportunities than some of them, or you can go to Europe for basketball and make good money. And, and then now hockey is, but that's grown over time, right? And and sure, yeah, yeah, there's no real middle class uh, for for entertainers for sure. So, so I had I had a, a little bit of a similar trajectory. I failed later on. Um, I failed at like 26 or 27 because of the market, because of the real estate market here. In 2008, it crashed, and I kind of lost everything. Things. Everything I had built up, the part I lost, and I didn't declare bankruptcy. And in retrospect, I really should have. It would have saved me a lot of years of pain of trying to dig out of it. So, you know, I really think that would have been the best move. But at the time, I was, it was the ultimate thing. Like I can't. I was in banking, so I was like, I can't declare bankruptcy. Which I, I should have had better advice, which I didn't have. But when I look back on it, um, I wasn't spending my money frivolously. I was just all in betting on one thing. Like I was like, I was 100% in on it. Do you look back at your acting and kind of what you were doing then? Is like. I wasn't doing the wrong thing. I was just 100% in on something that, that I didn't want to end up continuing. I mean, how do, you, how do you view it at this point? Like in terms of diversification or? Yeah, just like, just like you know, like, because I, I, at first I would look back at 2000, before 2008, I'm like, I made, I made all the wrong moves. But it was a great lesson for me. But now I look back on it and I, I look a little differently on it. I was like, I don't know if I made all the wrong moves. I just, I had nobody to tell me to diversify myself. Exactly. Like I was too leveraged in one thing and not another. It's like, do you think if somebody would have come to you at 18 and 19, it's like, hey, stop putting this money into businesses or to real estate or whatever, that you maybe would have lasted a little bit longer in acting or it would have been an easier transition? Uh, acting ultimately would have failed because my mind, my mindset wasn't in it. And once I'm demotivated from like, I'm all in on anything I do with sports growing up or, you know, whether it's basketball or rugby, mixed martial arts, you know, and then acting, it was all in with acting. And then it's, and then it's uh, on to the next, the next right uh, there. And business is something I could stay motivated about, which is why I like, like doing it. So there, there's a couple of things there for, in terms of diversification. Like I actually lost again. I wanted to bring up quickly, like about three years, close to three years ago now in a very nasty lawsuit before I understood what any of that stuff was, uh, uh, was about. Um, uh, got into a sticky situation where I put assets, you know, under someone's name and they took advantage of the situation. And, and I basically had to start over from scratch again, like three years ago. So that was a very important lesson wow. in legals and accounting and trust and and, uh, trust agreements and everything because I'd not really been operating that way. I was operating and doing good, but it wasn't dialed in. I didn't have like the the pieces. I, I wasn't building the team properly. I was relying too much on on faith um, that that people would figure things out that maybe weren't in the right position, right? So uh, in terms of what I'm doing though in diversification, like obviously I, I diversify a little bit like in, in crypto holdings and now and stocks and 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 um, and uh, you know cash building life insurance policies. Not nearly as much as I, I will or I should, because I've been very focused on uh, real estate in these, you know, uh, areas in Canada that I deem to be, you know, undervalued. I think a lot, pretty much all of the outskirts in Canada are currently undervalued just because of the demographics with supply and demand. Like they're the, the you know, lowest homes per capita in all the G7. We've got a combined vacancy of like 4% nationwide, and uh, that wow. doesn't include subsidized housing. And our province is 3.2 and it doesn't include subsidized housing. So if you run the math on it, we just increase immigration in Canada, if you're going to look at it holistically, to 400,000, which means you have about 500,000 people coming in a year if you include, you know, illegal people who come and just stay. So a half, half a million right there. We never really built more than 200,000 units in a, in a year. And if you have like a 4% vacancy on 15 million homes, and then you take out, you know, subsidized housing, because subsidized housing has a mile long waiting list in every single city and every single outskirt uh, city where the government's, you know, looking for affordable housing for rentals uh, for people who can't, can't find good homes. Uh, then you're down to about a half a million uh, homes is what, what we estimated. And you're like, well, that's a half a million vacant homes all across Canada. And we're immigrating four or 500,000 people. So we're going in these areas and taking homes that maybe are not in the greatest shape to be built up to single family homes and where the incomes are actually good. Uh, but the real estate market has been flat for 20, you know, 20, 30 plus years, which, uh, you know, if you have low vacancy and you have good income and you have, you know, doesn't real make sense. Come up yeah. in 20, 30 years is a disconnect, right? So yeah. Yeah. obviously that's our opportunity. And we're buying homes that significantly under the cost of build. So the way our model works is obviously cash flow based. And, you know, I like flat markets. There's no flat market right now, but I like investing in markets that don't go up because I want that under, it's like a, an undervalued stock paying a ridiculous dividend, you know?
Yeah, and, and you know what to expect, actually, too, because it's consistently the same way. So you kind of know what you're getting into. You're not worried about waves because you're getting in a certain place and you kind of know what's going to be there at the very least. You know what I mean? Yeah, if it goes up, great. I mean, ultimately, what we're trying to do in these cities, too, you know, and we can't do this alone, but we're, we're buying at scale and we go and we renovate properties as much as we possibly can. As the market goes closer to the price of build, we're able to do more renovations. Now, when it gets to the price of build is when the developers can afford to go in there and really, you know, build up uh, uh, a city. Because the number one factor in whether people are middle class or not is the real estate in their, in their city or town. And if you have a good income, but you were told to buy your home and 60% of people own homes and and you buy your home and then uh, and then it doesn't go up for 20, 30 years. Well, in the 90s, when it was two, three thousand dollars to fix a deck, now it's twenty thousand dollars. But you don't have that twenty thousand dollars anymore. You like your, your home hasn't gone up in value. How can you afford to do that? And if it doesn't keep um, up with the price of build, so rise of the rate of inflation, then people can't afford to renovate their homes. The city, you know, depreciates over time. There's less uh, taxes collected by the city for roads and everything like that, and it leads to uh, you know shitty infrastructure. Yeah, this, yeah. So, so, as far as your real estate goes, you've built up a, like a massive portfolio, obviously, over the last few years. Um, was this your, even before you went through, the, you know, start over? Has this been something you've been working on as far as this um, strategy? Is this a lo was it a long term thing for you? Was it something you you've changed, you've shifted to over the last few years? Yeah. So, I mean, I first started investing nine years ago, and I always, even when I got my first home for one hundred and twenty seven grand, I was telling my agent, one of the guys I still work with closely now. Uh, that I was gonna have a hundred homes somehow. I was like, I'm gonna, I don't know how, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. You know, I know the goal. I might have to change the plan to get to the goal, but I'm not gonna change the goal. And um, so, it, yeah, it was always kind of there. It's just my thing in Canada. We have smaller markets. If I was in the states, maybe I'd be in Silicon Valley raising uh, capital for something else I thought was valuable or good. But we didn't have yeah, as yeah. many opportunities like that in Canada. And I looked at real estate even back then. I mean, now it's over 10 trillion, but back then it was like a seven trillion, six, seven trillion dollar market in Canada. I'm like, well, that's definitely the biggest market in Canada. So can I figure out a way to scale a business? Because you know, most of my books, like although I'm in real estate, people think I'm more real estate based, it's more economics. It's more like, you know, in Canada, we have less data available on our real estate. We have a serious supply and demand issue, like bigger than any other country, in my opinion, developed nation. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, we're the second largest land mass. We have uh, the most precious resources in the world, second to Saudi Arabia. But if you take off oil, we're number one. We have 50% of the freshwater lakes. We're a larger land mass in the United States. We have one tenth the population. That's so, so interesting. If Canada was a dividend, I would throw my money into Canada. But um, so, but like that, so I, I see a lot of factors there that are good, but it's the biggest market. So I, I treat it like a company is what I was saying. It wasn't necessarily just about the real estate. I want to do good, but I was like, how do I grow a scalable, like 10 figure business? How do I, and real estate seemed to be the way that it was possible. Like my, my, uh, we still operate like a normal company. We have our executive team. We have our managers in each of the three divisions. So we have an acquisitions team. We have our prop in-house property management, and then we have our construction company. But our construction company is just site supervisors and project managers. It manages about 200 sub-trades at any given time. So we're running at about 60, 70 sites at any given time, which could be mainly residential, single-family, and multifamily homes. But we do uh, buy some uh, commercial apartments and stuff as well, too. But uh, the single families is where the real demand is. I'll throw in one more uh, uh, fact for you. But with the uh, in Canada right now, so last year, we actually upped it. There were two... Uh, or the past 12 months, like 260,000 scheduled new builds. But the problem is, is that over 55% of them are uh, purpose-built condos or apartments, which have like a three to four year timeline. And outside of, you know, the GTA, like in greater Toronto area, over 60% of the sales are single family homes. So under 20% of the new builds are single family homes, but all the demand is for uh, single family homes. That's where the squeeze is right now. People, people really want those. And um, uh and there's not enough of them yeah. and for the rental market. There's not enough good ones on the market. You, you, you put a lot more questions in my head. So I didn't know this much about the Canadian market. So you're giving me an education, first of all. Second of all, um, the big problem we had here when the market crashed in, in 2007, 2008 was that um, you know, credit guidelines were loose. It, it, this is in my opinion, but I think this is pretty accurate. Credit guidelines are loose, right? And there was an overabundance of building. So, there was, so we had a ton of inventory. We had loose credit guidelines. Everybody could buy. And then when the, when the credit guidelines pulled back and they, and they said, hey, we're not financing these homes anymore, then you had all, all these houses sitting or they were overpriced. You guys, 
do you see any kind of building boom coming? Because it, it sounds like there should be, right? Like you have all this land that, you know, the, it's, it's a great place to live. There's plenty of money to be made there. Do you see that, the, the, do you think building is something that's gonna happen there and boom at any, at any point? Yes, the, the, the biggest problem right now is that like the major uh, metropolitan, like GTA major metropolitan areas, um, the, the average cost of a single family home is over a over million dollars. So the problem is, is that the, the developers who have been around for a long time, they already know their sites in the next five or 10 years. And if other people try to compete with them, they don't really do that well. But you can't afford to go, like right now we invest heavily in Northern Ontario. Before it was Southern Ontario. So Niagara Falls, the Canadian side around okay. that area. And then there was a boom and then developers came in. But what Canada needs, it's not even uh, these existing developers to grow because they're not going to two or three X what they're doing. They know what they're doing the next 10 years. They're already you know doing quite yeah, well. They, they have their strategy. They, they're set to the strategy that makes money and they're, they're not moving. Exactly. So my uh, theory on that is that the develop the communities that are around, say, you know, an hour outside or a couple hours outside or other other major cities like Sudbury is one area we invest in in Ontario um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I'll get into after. But but, uh, you know, once these areas go to the price of build, like right now, if you could buy a single family home or a 1700 square foot home for like 220,000 Canadian, 230 Canadian, which would be like 150, 160 uh us i mean we can't there's no way you can build here under 250 dollars a square foot so from a macro perspective and it's probably it's it's realistically more than that but let's say you're a tiny developer you could somehow get away with it you have an exemption on development fees somehow you can get away with 250 canadian a square foot well until you can start building single family homes and selling them at that price um you're not going to bring new developers online so we need new new developers in those communities and we need Got to it. get to the price of build not in Toronto, where we're, you know, 1,200, 1,400 square foot or whatever, because um, although that adds more money to the economy, it's not helping those other areas. And, and you're going to have the same developers. We need developers that haven't existed before coming onto the market in new areas where they're not going to have to compete with the, the big guys. And the only way that you can do that is to level out the economy um, in terms of real estate prices and, and start with what we call ourselves like the fluffers and people coming in and taking the existing shitty inventory or somewhat okay inventory and building that uh, up again to kind of appreciate prices. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and, and you're in California, California now, so you, you obviously know, you know this market well as well in the United States. States. I mean, our problem, our problem over the last year has been inventory, inventory but, but there's, no, there's land no land either. either. So, it's so it's not like, like it's not like you could like build. build. So it's either so been rehabs or it's been rehashes or it's been knocked down and built up. So it's a different issue than you're having there, which it's perplexing to me because I'm not used to it, but it's still a problem. Is developing there or building there as far as getting permits and funding and stuff like that, is it difficult or is it just not readily available to new people? So it, it's easier in areas like Toronto and whatnot. I like to look at Canada as like, it's very similar to the States, but it's like a franchise economy because we're so spread out. So if you go to like the suburbs, you'll see a lot of the same strip malls that have the same franchises. It's relatively new, it looks good, but it's not as much in the independence there, right? Sure. Um, so, I mean, the permitting, if you're going in Toronto is they're, they're very used to it, right? When I started investing in Southern Ontario, uh, like Niagara area, the city wasn't used to having tons of permits come in. So you're dealing with, um, you know, inexperience at times. And then within five, six years of me being there, they actually were trying to hire so quick that they had to sub out 50% of the permits coming into a, a separate uh, company in order to get through the permits that were coming in uh, to their city. So there's inexperience in some of the, the cities that haven't had development in 10, 20, 30 years. And of course, you know, there's not always an understanding between developers in the cities and like the developers are really trying to help the city. Sometimes the people at the city don't always, it seems like they don't view it that way, right? But uh, so yeah, for sure it can have its difficulties. In fact, most of our sites right now, because the places that we invest in are really, really undervalued, um, we're not, we don't even have permits because the majority of it's cosmetic. Only about 10% of our work right now is, is uh, permitted work on some larger apartments and things like that. Uh, which helps speed up production, but there's good quality production in the uh, or, or properties in the areas that we invest in that are structurally sound homes that are just way under the price of build for Got no it. reason with low vacancy, right? So. Got it. So, so if you were to, um, like, if you were to recommend somebody getting in, right? If people are listening, they're like, oh, well, in general, you know, you went towards uh, a strategy to renovate underprivileged neighborhoods, right? Like, so, like, how did you, you know? And you told us a little bit about why you went that way. Um, you know, do you feel like there's better profit margins on that for you? You feel like it's a system you, 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 that was 
it doesn't seem like it's easy at all. It seems like it's probably a, a task to get into, but why did you choose that over other strategies? I think it's safer. And I looked at it as an asset. I had been leasing our home for our, our primary residence in the GTA for years because, you know, our, our last place we, when we worked the expenses, our lease was like one third what it would have been cost to, to finance it, right? Because it's in a nice area. You're yeah. like, okay, well, it was an asset or a liability. It was a rich dad, poor dad, 101, yeah. uh, you know, philosophy. <laughs> And, and I feel like you're doing more value. I mean, there's always going to be at least, you know, 45 to six, 45 to 55 percent of the economy, let's say, uh, renting homes. And if there's a lot of shitty landlords, our, our philosophy in RWC management, our property management company, is that we consolidate shitty landlords, right? <laughs> out, you don't fix toilets or new plumbing equipment. Like we're always putting in new stainless steel appliances. We're always trying to uh, increase the value of the home, but increase the, the quality uh, for tenants as well, too, because a lot of them have just had short end of the stick in these areas and i've always had decent landlords but if you're in better areas it's easier actually i've had a couple of crappy landlords too but you know what i mean it, it, for me um it, it's the safest in investment because you know if something were to happen like if i when i was bartending we had a home and it's like okay well if i lose my job well if my home's still making me 500 a month you know net plus paying off equity i don't i don't need to sell that that's just another asset for me it's a longer term uh place. So I feel like it adds more value. I think increasing the value in these areas under the price of build helps bring things to the middle class and it's better for equality, whereas taking a $2 million to 4 million. I mean, it's good. It's nice. Don't get me wrong. Like, you know, anything for people to spend money, there's nothing worse that a rich person can do than hoard money. If they have yeah. it, spend it, you know, ballers are good for the economy. I tell people that yeah, because yeah, like, Dude, as long as they're spending it, you should be happy. That's and, true. Uh, so I agree <laughs> with that. But in terms of like uh, equality, um, I think it makes more sense to invest money. And we, you know, same with hiring all local trades. Like, it's not like we're doing all of this for philanthropic work, but a lot of it actually winds up being incredible value in those communities and raising the status quo. And so I think you have more uh, ability to do that. And new investors can get in cheap. It was the only place I could afford as well, too. So it's the best yeah. investment. If a recession happens, where is it going to go? It hasn't gone anywhere in 20, 30 not years. Not going ago. down, yeah. Yeah, you know, and certainly less than the GTA. So we didn't have a, a recession in 2008 because we have much stricter banking policies. Like we, even us on the on the side of how many homes we've done, like the bank, when we refinance, they're like, yeah, maybe 65, 70%. And we can have incredible, we could be at like a 7% cap. They don't care. That's smart. Right? Yeah. So they're, they're more strict on that end. Um, so we, it just kind of leveled out. And then when recessions do hit, they hit the uh, upper class cities much harder than they do the ones that have not appreciated because the ones that haven't appreciated I haven't appreciated it. So. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes sense. No, and it's, it, I like that it's a good strategy because your your risk is low. You know, you have a lower risk than you would in most markets. So I think that's that's really really smart. Um, I heard you actually. I read that you said this, and now I just heard you say it. Right. So you said uh, I read. You said it's not it's not the goal that should should change, but the plan. Like, and I love that you said that. Right. So because I always say that um, short term failures shouldn't affect your long term goal. So. Uh, so I love that you say that. So at this point, um, you know, where where is your plan? Like, what is your plan now for the next few years for, for the real estate? And, you know, you do an amazing job with branding. So I kind of wanted to, to, to put that in that in the two. Like, how are you directing your brand and your plan for the next few years? Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. I mean, I have a lot of help with the, the branding stuff. I was a little reluctant to start getting back out there because, like, in TV, I said, um, and I'm not there again yet by any means, but there's nothing worse than being semi-famous, right? Like it's yeah. so <laughs> like when people don't know your name, but they're like, oh, I've seen you on a show. What, what show is that that I've seen you on? You're yeah. like, oh, uh, maybe this one, like, no, 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 that's not a good show. <laughs> and so like, you know, it's not fun. And, and so, but um, I think it's important because like I said, I really have a thing for athletes and entertainers because I was, I, I would have been an athlete if I, if I was good enough. And, and I grew up in entertainment, but I didn't have the financial education. I had the means, but I didn't have the education. So I think, you know, it's not how much you make, it's what you do with the money you make. And, and I've made everything without being able to get to a six-figure salary again and things like that. And, 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 and just by understanding money and, uh, and business. So my, my short-term goal is like, I want to get, I want to be, um, and it didn't work that way because I just didn't know the math in it. But I think by end of next year, if I'm not already, be the largest residential um, uh, holder, private holder of, ca uh, of property in, in Canada. And um, I'd like to grow it to a, a 10 figure portfolio. And, um, you know, the machine's running good. Our production's great. Everything's there. We're, we're working new financing things that, that haven't really been done with this many residential houses. It's been a, it's been a trick, but 
with me, businesses are just about problem solving. And if it starts getting complacent or easy, you got to put more problems on your, on your plate. Right. And that's the biggest thing you just hit on adversity like or, or, or going in there is that like, people don't understand that if you're going to get into a, a business, all you're doing is problem solving, you know, and you're not gonna be able to do it your, yourself. So you're going to want to be around people who can problem solve as well too. And once you stop wanting to problem solve, then you stop wanting to really grow your business. One thing's all oh, I know you repetitious. Okay, cool. You can maybe maintain that if nobody tries to, you know, take you out, but you always got to be innovating and you should put problems on your plate. I, I typically hit, I think like we'll probably end the year at about between 70 and 80 million in acquisitions. And I think my goal was a hundred million in acquisitions this year. Right. And as I say, I tend to hit about 70% of my goals because they're, they're so big that if I were to hit them, it's like, okay, well, that goal was a little bit too easy. But your brain just thinks differently. If you were to say, hey, I want to have, I just do this like randomly to people. Like, How many homes do you want to have? Two. Okay, well, why don't you want to have 10, right? And just run that experience. What would you need to do? Because when I first start saying my goals at the end of every year, I actually don't, I'll say something outrageous. And unlike people like, you know, who, who walk, you know, like, oh, don't, don't say it before you do it and all that. No, I preach it to everybody. I'll tell everybody when I'm, because I want that yeah. accountability. <laughs> So I start saying it out loud. And then once I kind of believe okay. it, I'll get to like my wife or, or, or executives or whatever and be like, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. Like I've already st started putting out like, let's bump our acquisitions to like 20 to 30 million a month next year, right? And trying to put that out there and then being like, what steps do we, how do we, okay, we can't do that right now. How do we get that done though? What does that look like? And then trying to problem solve that. So if you turn it into more of a game, it's going to make it much easier to persevere. And then- the other part of that is uh, starting very easy. Like, like I recommend people on their first home, start cheap, start on something that's not going to require massive renovations because you are going to have problems and the lower your problems on things that you don't know, like if you bought an apartment right off the building, you're going to have big problems. But if you bought a small single family and the inspection went okay and there's no plumbing issues, only so much can go wrong. And you're going to want to have those problems before you're experiencing the bigger ones so you don't get discouraged. Because, you know, problem solving and, and not getting discouraged, those are the two things that are gonna help you be successful in hitting your That's, that's, you dropped a bunch of gems in that, in that but, you, but you're right, I like, I like what you said most about, like, if, if you're not problem solving, then you're not working on anything. Like, you have to keep adding more problems to your desk. Like, that's really the truth. And, and some people say, I, I do nothing but problems all day, but like, your problems get bigger, but your income also gets bigger with that too. I heard, um, Jeff Bezos say something recently and it really resonated with me. Not that I'm anywhere near that level, but it resonated with me anyway. He said, when I first started my business, um, I would answer a thousand questions a day. He's like, now I only answer three or four questions a day, but they're really, really important questions. So like, I have to be prepared for those three or four questions. And the other thing he said that in that same talk that resonated with me was that um, if you ask him what's going on in his business today, he couldn't tell you. He's never concentrated on this quarter. He's concentrated now because he has help, obviously, but three and four years in the future always. He's always innovating. So like, I think those are the two things, like solving bigger problems and then continuing to make sure you're innovating yourself and you're not staying still, right? Yeah, you brought up something really good there too. And that's a, that's a trust factor too. He's like, I couldn't tell you what goes on in my business today. My uh, executive, like who I talk to is my executive team now, accountant, lawyers, and, and you know, and then they, they'll talk to management from there. And if it wasn't COVID, I'd go into the office and, you know, like, and, and say we'd be out more in staff parties. But, but the reality is you can only have so many levels of communication. And my team is good with that. I've never had an issue trusting people. The problem is, is I've trusted people in the wrong place and allowed them to do their thing because I'm a terrible manager. And I know that about myself, right? I don't like to manage. So uh, my executive team is good with it. And they're like, they don't try to include me in anything. They don't, <laughs> like, they're just like, wait, and if there's, which, which is good. I mean, could I have 5% more efficiency in areas where I'm micromanaging? Likely. But then it, you know, the majority of my days are actually spent like reading, listening to an audio book and things. And I have my meetings, but that's a majority of it because things can come a lot closer when you're not right into it. You can have a, a person who's got maybe a medium, like a 50% of your understanding on business. If you're in your business all day long and you're say twice as educated as this guy is much of business, but he's not, he's a completely outside perspective and he comes in. Um, he's probably going to offer you a lot of good information that you're not aware of because you're, you're so involved in the day to day. Uh, and, and, and that's true. That's why they say, listen to your staff, listen to people uh, when you're in there. Cause they know. So I put it on my, sometimes I'll offer perspectives to my management. Like what's the issue here, right? Okay. Is it, you know, is it, who's the issue with like, and if you have that level of accountability, say with your executive team, the only faults I can place on people are my executive team or lawyers in them. Then they have to go to the next, like the management there and the people underneath. And that creates a team of all-stars as well too. 
because I don't care what company it is. It's the executive team's fault if something doesn't get done and their problem solving. Where, where does yeah. it, where does it, um, who, who does it fall on? And it makes it much easier to run a business uh, that way. That, yeah, that's the, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, it's funny. Um, sometimes I feel like I have um, almost like a, Guilt, you know, it's, I, I, I work, I was a lot more in the business in my past history right now. And now between me and my partner, we have about 50 mortgage offices and 250 employees. And um, I'm more working on the business at this point than in the business every single day. And sometimes that feels weird. Sometimes it feels like, am I not doing enough today that I used to do? But it, you're just, you're kind of working differently. And, you, and for you, I hear what you're saying too. You're like, it's, it's awesome that you said, I suck at managing people because you know, I have to know my weaknesses and what I'm not good at. And I'm the same at you. Like, I'm not good at negotiating things sometimes. And I'm not good at saying no sometimes. So I have to have people around me that can do that for me so I don't make mistakes. Well, well big mistakes, mistakes at least. least. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I think a little trick to play, too, is that, uh, that, that I've done before is pretend you're bad at everything. Even the things that you're great at. Right. That's like, point. yeah, because, because ultimately it's like, well, unless you want to be uh, doing any of those, that's how you build a, a perfect company. And, and then it becomes a balancing act. But pretend you're bad at everything. And it's like, how do I work backwards? And even the stuff you're good at, it's going to be easier for you to recruit at stuff you're good at because you're like, no, 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 this is how you do it. Or you can mentor in, in that way as well, too. Yeah, I heard. So I was talking to somebody over the weekend and I heard that they said about me that, oh, he's very, very good at finding people to do things that he doesn't know how to do. And I said, that's a great point. I was like, and I'm good with that. Like I'm, I'm very good at adding like either accountability partners or people around me that know how to do things that I can't do that well. But you know, just, I think what I'm hearing from you and, and I feel this way is that you really want to do everything at a high level. Like you never know, don't want to be at a high level when you're doing things. So you're willing to take on help to get things done at a high level because you don't want to perform poorly. Yeah, the truth and to answer that out like my few year, like it's actually not so much about money. I just understand that having access to capital and things like that uh, get, gets you choices. I, there, there's things that I want to do that are, you know, in other nations or even just meet with people like uh, politicians in general and, and things like that, that I want to get access to to figure out what's going on in this world. My purpose is more about to figure out answers, like I said, problem solving. Okay, how does this world actually work more than it is about money? But, you know, how it works in, in our world is if you have money and access to capital. I mean, it's just the truth of the matter. If, I, if you want yeah. to go to a political convention and pay 10, 20, 30, 40,000 for a ticket, like they're expensive, but this is how you, this is how people get access to certain things. Um, and I'd like to bring more of that out to the public. That's why I say, I don't even, I believe in coaching heavily. I think coaching helps for real estate big time, but I don't actually sell coaching services or anything. I'm putting information out for free because I didn't have that. And I want to be that spark to get people to go. And so I'll recommend coaching for real estate, but I'm trying to get the education out there. And that's why I work with entertainers and athletes. Cause I'm like, well, their audience, you know, needs this information uh, i wish yeah. i would have if i would have had it i probably you know i don't even know what i would have done if i knew what i knew at uh, 17 right so yeah. no, and you and you can speak the language too obviously when you're with these people you understand kind of where they're at and where they're coming from the mentality of an artist i'm sure you you get that too so it's probably you're probably the right person to be speaking to them you know and, yeah, I, just, and I, I, I style I, a rap and then uh, no 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 <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, uh, but no, yeah, exactly. I, I can I can relate, right? Like, cause I, I was in there for ten years. I know the industry. I know not so much in the music industry, but I understand what the entertainment business is like. They're very similar. There's a lot of things that are parallel. Yeah, I mean, listen, and I, and I, I think what you said is really important. I think, and, I, and I'm, I agree with you. I want to change things, and, and I'm, I love mentoring and I love teaching. But and I had this conversation with somebody younger that worked with me last week. I said, listen, you really want to impact change. You have to do it from a place of financial security. Uh, because then you can really impact change because then you can offer people not just knowledge but how you got to the money how how you can offer them jobs how you can really impact lives you have to really do that from a place of financial security it's hard to do that when you're not financially secure yourself and i think that's a lot of the problems that i have with social media and all that stuff it's like who are the really authentic people that are actually doing the work, right? And like, that's who I want to get to. And that's part of the reason, the creative of this whole entire brand. And that's why we're having you on because you're somebody who's authentic that's actually doing the work. I, I appreciate that, man. And, and I know what you mean, right? Like I said, I love, look at a lot of people on Instagram. I'm like, what, what, do, you, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you do? Like, how is it? But, you know, it, it, and there's things that I don't understand. I mean, some people legitimately do make money on, on TikTok and, and Instagram and things like that. So I, I understand that in the platforms of, you know, change the game with streams and whatnot but but yeah you're right i mean mine does come from a place of like i, I since i had my even though i wasn't like have a, a, as access to as much back then i understood what it was like to feel like you had everything 
And it, that doesn't really ultimately make you happy. So like that also, I think knowing that money is not my uh, yeah. only driving factor is the thing that helps me make decisions as well too, but it's not going to make you happy. In fact, it'll make you depressed if you think that just having money is going to make you happy. It'll solve some short-term issues and you'd obviously rather wake up rich than broke any day. But, um, you know, it doesn't solve all your issues. It just opens up some new ones and you got to explore how you can do better. And I think that's the way, once you figure out the money game, it's like, okay, well, how can I impact people in a better way? And I'm not saying I figured it all out. I mean, I have problems every day still, but I do know enough where it's like, like I feel at the position now, it wouldn't happen now because we're just set up different. But if everything were taken away from me tomorrow, I feel like I could do the same thing bigger, but, you know, within six months to a year this time, just through knowledge, right? Like then, then, uh, then, than anything else. If you know what you're doing, you can find everything else. Yeah, I, th- I think two things you said that, that are great. Uh, and the first thing is money's not gonna make you happy. I think that you're right. I think some people get to the money at some point and, they, and they, that was the moment, right? And they get there and they're like, well, this isn't so great. Like, cause it, you're right, because having money doesn't make you happy. You're right, I'd rather wake up rich than poor, but it doesn't really make you happy. And the second thing you said is that, um, you know, the kind of the journey there is the fun part, right? And I say to people all the time, like, if I could start all over again from zero, almost like um, undercover billionaire, millionaire, right? Like if they could just drop me off somewhere and I, I could build it over again, like that would be exciting. Like I, like if, if, you know, if I could start fresh and I had nothing, I think I could, but I could do it with the knowledge I have now, which would be awesome. Um, it would be really a lot of fun. So I think the journey there is a lot of part of what the fun is and people don't get that when they're at the, we're in the start of it, you know? 100%, and you know that, like you, you start in the batting cages, you're not going to the, to the highest level on the first one, you know? <laughs> you're starting and then you get better and better and you're like oh if i did it this way it'd be you know you know that's 100 percent. so i I often say like if you had the information 24 hours advance you could be the wealthiest person in the world right so like uh hindsight that's that's great but it's uh it's it's uh that that's how it is i think that's a big and you you shed light to that as well and uh, on your podcast and stuff though again is that you know, business and money is a topic like anything else in life, like educate, like working out, you know, you work out consistently, so you're in good shape, right? You're, you're not going to get there without doing it. You don't look ripped without putting in the work. It just doesn't happen. So it doesn't matter what you want to learn or anything. And people understood that about money because it is their drive. People go to school to get a high income and you're like, you know, and, and then when really they should look at, you know, supply and demand, we have tons of lawyers and engineers now all over the world because 20, 30 years ago, Parents are like, oh, we need more engineers. And then by the time that cycle goes through, now we're overloaded with engineers. India has four or 500,000 graduates a year there. And we've got lawyers and, you know, every single uh, complex in the United States, you know, and, and it's uh, so, you, you know, but really they're doing this for financial security. And we are in an age now where I think things are going to shift a lot in 10, 20 years. I don't know if we're going to have a new investor class or what's going to happen, but we have access to have more prosperity for everyone and it's just a, a way of trying to figure it out how, how we more evenly distribute it in a, in, a, in a capitalist way, if that makes sense. And I think, you know, helping educate people will, will, will help that. I have some other theories on blockchain and stuff about, you know, valuing all assets and, and, and whatnot that would help in, in the future. But I think in general, just educating people right now who have no education is a, is a good way to start. Yeah, I think, I, I think, you know, it's so easy to get the education now, you know, just... You could be a YouTube all star at this point, and you know anything. This people get, and there's so many people, and people like you, like you're very authentic, and you're trying to give away free information to people. It's like if people are really listening, you can you can really get to it. And what I like a lot about your message is that I still hear the principles of rich dad poor dad in it. You know, even like your foundation is that. So like even a lot of the stuff you talk about, I resonates to me that that was where it came from. Like so, I think um, that's a, a great tip too, Robbie. Where is um, you're giving out all this free information, right? Like, where is the best place for people to get it from you and talk to you if possible? Like, where would you recommend people come, come find you? Yeah, honestly, the only one I um, post things myself on my, on my story is my personal Instagram page, which is at uh, Robbie W. Clark, R-O-B-B-Y uh, W-C-L-A-R-K. Um, I never really got into Twitter too much. There is a TikTok account, but I don't, I don't manage that one. I post my own stories and stuff like that. Uh, on my page, basically of what I'm reading. I'll read, you know, in the morning, a couple hours, articles, different things. And if I see something I think is interesting, I just post it for that day. And so I'll have, I have things saved in homes that gives you tips on homes, on, on, uh, on my story highlights, uh, some on crypto, just different stories I've saved that if you just go through it, it's probably like a mini book, um, but it gives you, whether it's real estate advice or projects that we've done 
or uh, my just general advice on anything, whether it's economics, crypto, business, not too much politics. I don't like to get into that too yeah. much. I'm the same. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. <laughs> and and as far as you're you're in California right now, is that a new home? Is that a temporary place? Like, what's the what's the deal with the West Coast? Are you here to stay for a little while? Yeah, I was hoping to stop getting so crazy in Canada, but um, you know, I was actually born in the states initially, and I lived out in LA 2005 to 2007. So Canada okay. is definitely home. I'm going home in the next week or or so, but. You know, I've got some friends out here as well, too, and a couple of businesses that have, that have been starting up out here as well, too, that, um, you know, I, I'm definitely going to probably be here, probably split my time half between the states, half between uh, Canada. So maybe the colder months be out here. Yeah, um, smart. <laughs> that. smart. What are you going on, too? Canada has been really uh, locked up. So we were in Florida, uh, L.A., and um Vegas for a couple of the fights because I'm a big uh, mixed martial arts fan. So, uh, very cool. cool. Yeah. So that's that's uh, that's the plan for right. The plan is the plan is to be all over right now as long as it's warm, right? That's yeah, too cold. Well, I, I'm I'm in Florida quite a bit and I'm in California some, so I'm gonna try to catch up with you at some point. And uh, you were awesome. I really appreciate you being on. Um, I think that you really authentically drop a lot of stuff that people should be listening to, and I think it's coming from a good place. So, so thank you for your message and thank you for coming on, and, and I appreciate it. Hey, man, I appreciate that. And, uh, anytime, anytime you want me on, I'm, I'll, I'll come back. So, uh, All right, dude. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Thank you, Have a great day. All right, all right brother. Take care.